And our, we have one final speaker, and this is uh, Sarah Tishkop. She's a professor at UPenn and an explorer in the closest sense, to, closest to the geographic sense of the word. Her work bridges the barriers of distance to research genome variation on the global scale. Today, she'll share with us her work on common traits that influence, like co common variants and in influencing common traits in our daily experience of food, taste, and lactose intolerance. Here's Sarah. Thanks. Hello. I am really excited to be here today to tell you about some of our research, which focuses on studying genetic and phenotypic variation in Africa. And I want to tell you first why I think Africa is such an interesting place to look at. And for one, it's thought that all modern humans originated in Africa about 200,000 years ago. These red dots are representing sites where there's fossil evidence for the earliest modern humans. And the earliest site is dated to about 150 to 190,000 years ago in southern Ethiopia. There's also evidence for very early modern behavior in Africa. So this is a um, piece of carved ochre dated to about 70,000 years ago. And there's some that's dated even further back to about 100, 120,000 years ago. And then after we originated in Africa, somewhere around 50 to 100,000 years ago, a small numbers, small numbers of people migrated out of Africa, giving rise to the people in the rest of the world. So because of that, there tends to be a decrease in variation outside of uh, Africa, and Africans have the highest levels of genetic diversity. And they've maintained that for a very long period of time. Now, despite the importance of studying Africa in terms of learning more about African history and also for looking at um, disease prevalence, it's been very underrepresented in human genetic studies. And for that reason, myself and my students and my collaborators have been doing field work in Africa for over 12 years. We're mainly focusing on minority populations. Um, and this is, I like this photo because it's showing you, this is uh, Simon Thompson, Alessia Ranciaro, and it gives you both the outside perspective, we have to bring all of our lab supplies with us, and also the inside perspective as well. Some of the other uh, hazards that we face is that here it happens to be the rainy season. And in each of these re regions, this is a picture of the Hadza hunter-gatherers who live in Tanzania, they speak with the click language. So we explained the project to them. I don't speak, I speak a little Kiswahili, but not their language, so I have a translator. But we also get detailed ethnographic information, information about diet, for example. And then we get phenotypic information, like height and weight. And we're getting very detailed information here about blood pressure, we're looking at skin pigmentation, percent body fat, and so on. And then from each of these subjects, we're obtaining blood, and from that we can get DNA. But this is quite a challenge, because usually there's no electricity, so we have to be a little clever. In this case, we've hooked up the uh, centrifuge to the car battery. This is Simon working in the Hadza area. So what he had to do, he literally brought a generator and then set the lab up there, and brought liquid nitrogen and so on. You can imagine how challenging that is. One of the things we do is we basically break open the red cells, we spin down the white cells, and that's the part that contains the DNA. And then we have to process them and get them in a format so that they're basically stable at uh, African temperature. <laughs> or we bring liquid nitrogen and freeze and then bring back. So I just want to give you a sense of how much variation there is in Africa. And this is from a study we published a few years ago. And these uh, different colors represent inferred ancestral populations in Africa determined by genetic variation across the genome. So all the different colors represent all the genetic variation in Africa. And you can see that populations, for example, in East Africa are very different than West Africa or Southern Africa. And that reflects their demographic history as well as adaptation to different environments. And as you can see from some of the faces, a lot of phenotypic variation as well. Now, one of the other things we want to do is find regions of the genome that are targets of natural selection. 
And that's important partly because it's thought that mutations associated with common diseases like diabetes and hypertension and so on may have been adaptive in a past environment, but in today's environment, they're no good for us. So we wanna to try to find these. And we've looked at groups that have very diverse diets and live in very diverse climates. They have different infectious disease exposures, so they've probably undergone local adaptation. And the first, I'm gonna give you two examples. The first one I'm gonna tell you about is the evolution of lactose tolerance in East African pastoralists. Now, the ability to digest milk as adults is due to the presence of um, an enzyme called lactase fluorazine hydrolase, and it's expressed specifically in the brush border cells of the small intestine. So in those people who have an active form of that enzyme as adults, they're able to break down the sugar lactose into glucose and galactose, that's taken up into the bloodstream. And if they cannot, in most mammals and in most humans actually, this enzyme is shut down shortly after weaning. So if they were as adults to try to drink milk, they're not gonna be able to break down that compound sugar. It's gonna to go to the lower intestine, it's gonna get intact by bacteria and have some nasty side effects. Now, anthropologists have noted for many years a correlation between the prevalence of lactose tolerance and the practice of dairying or cattle domestication. So the highest prevalence is in the very north of Europe, and then it decreases as we go into southern Europe, a very low prevalence in East Asia, in Native Americans, and in most West Africans, which is why it's also prevalent in African Americans. But in East Africans that practice cattle domestication, they're pastoralists, they have a very high prevalence of this trait. Now in 2002, a mutation was identified that's associated with lactose tolerance in Europeans, but when we looked in the Africans, they didn't have it. So what we did was something called a lactose tolerance test. And what you do is you basically take the sugar lactose, you're gonna, it's kind of like an orange flavor, like Kool-Aid, you mix it with water, and everybody's at time test. So we have to have everybody drinking this at the same time. Believe it or not, this is part of the challenge is getting people to stay put for about an hour. This is a group from Ethiopia. The other was the Maasai from Tanzania. And then we're gonna use a simple diabetes monitoring kit where you can just take a prick of blood and you can measure blood sugar, glucose levels. And we're gonna do that at baseline and then we're gonna do that every 20 minutes over an hour. And then you're gonna mark down the maximum rise in blood glucose, okay? And if it's past a certain threshold, then you're considered lactose tolerant or to have the lactase persistent trait, otherwise you're intolerant. And this is looking at a group of about 500 East African pastoralists. So what we did is we actually identified three novel mutations that were near the lactase gene, but actually were in a non-coding region of a neighboring gene and they regulate expression of that gene. We showed that they arose independently from the mutation that regulates lactose tolerance in Europe, and that's due to something called convergent evolution. And furthermore, although these are very common, sometimes 30 to 40% frequency, they are very geographically restricted, and that's probably because they arose independently in these different regions. And in fact, they're actually an excellent marker for tracing migration for that reason. Now, the next thing we wanted to do was to look for that genomic footprint of selection. And we saw a really whopping signature of selection. So here in red are individuals who have two copies of the C variant associated with lactose tolerance. And we genotype genetic variants going on millions of nucleotides flanking. And then we simply ask the question, um, are they, do they have two copies of the next variant? And if so, keep drawing the line, then the next one, then the next one. When they don't have two copies, we drop, we, we cut it off there. And what we can see is that people who have that variant um, have similar, have homozygosity extending millions of nucleotides. And that's a very different picture than what you see on, for the other chromosomes. And that's consistent with very recent strong natural selection, sweeping this uh, mutation up to very high frequency. And in fact, we estimated the age of that mutation to be about 3,000 to 7,000 7, years old. And what's interesting about that is it actually correlates with the time of introduction of cattle domestication into sub-Saharan Africa. So it's a great example of gene culture coevolution. 
Second thing that I'm going to tell you about is a study that we did. This was done by a postdoc named Michael Campbell on the evolution of uh, ability to taste bitter taste substances, PTC in particular. Now here's a couple of some types of uh, greens that many of you might find to be kind of yucky, but then again, some of you might like these, right? There's probably quite a bit of variation in this room, actually, in terms of how you taste these. Now, this is due to a phytochemicals that are in these, um, these different types of uh, vegetables. And it's actually thought, people have hypothesized that the reason we can taste bitter and the reason it's in these plants is it's a warning sign that many plants that are toxic are very bitter. Okay, so it's thought that that might be one of the reasons we have this bitter taste perception. Um, now, the ability to taste uh, phenolthiocarbamide or PTC is, was one of the earliest classic polymorphisms found in humans, known since the 1930s. I think somebody asked a question actually where they mentioned this, that probably you've done this in high school where you've taken the piece of paper and you taste it, and like half the people can taste it and half of the people can't. So this is the substance that we're looking at. So we say that people who um, can taste it, we're gonna call them tasters and others are non-tasters. And both of those are common in Europeans. Now you heard a lovely presentation and a beautiful video in Andreas' talk where he talked about these receptors, olfactory receptors, pretty much the same thing, very similar when we're talking about taste perception. There are going to be receptors that are on cells that are located within the taste bud and there are different receptors for things like tasting sweet or uh, salt or bitter and so on. And what I'm gonna be focusing on are these receptors that recognize uh, substances that give off a bitter taste. And the one that I'm gonna focus on is one that's coded by a gene called TAS2R38. And this turns out to be, it's a very small gene, just about 1,000 nucleotides in length, and so making it very easy to sequence. And in Europeans and Asians, there are three common amino acid variants. So you can have a proline or alanine, alanine valine, valine isoleucine. But what's interesting is that they're always linked together. And we call this arrangement on a chromosome a haplotype. Okay, the way, the way they're arranged on a chromosome is a haplotype. So outside of Africa, pretty much we see PAV together, and uh, people who have that haplotype are tasters, or AVI, and those individuals are non-tasters. So when we did this test in the field, this was a bit challenging. Here's some of the logistical challenges, which is just finding space to do this, because what you're gonna do is give a series of dilutions. And you're gonna start with the most dilute and then work your way up to the most concentrated. So basically, you're gonna have people take a sip of this and then they spit it out. Then they're gonna take a sip of the next one until the point where they go, oh, yuck, and they spit that out. And then we write that down as the threshold at which they can taste. And so we did this test in over 600 individuals across Africa. And these include people with very different diets, including pygmy hunter-gatherers and East African pastoralists. And when we started this, our theory, our hypothesis was, these people with really different diets, if this is adaptive for, for um, diet, it should be pretty different in these different populations. And then we also sequenced this gene in some comparative non-Africans. And what we found were 21 variants in the coding region. And interestingly, nine of those, 19 of those resulted in an amino acid change. That's pretty unusual, that's a lot of variation. Some of these are specific to different regions and only three of them um, are found globally and those are the three that I already mentioned to you. So I'm gonna be focusing quite a bit on those. Now we did something that's, I'm not gonna get into the details, but it's a test to see if a gene is under selection. And if you see here a bar that goes down in this direction, that indicates positive selection for a variant. And we saw that in the regulatory regions flanking the gene. But when we look at the coding regions, you see that it's going up like this. That's an indication that common variation is being maintained. And we tend to see that when there's balancing selection. So for some reason, diversity is being maintained at this gene. And if we look at the haplotypes 
as I told you, outside of Africa, we have predominantly the PAV taster haplotype and the AVAI non-taster. And in Africa, we also see that those two are common, but we see some other haplotypes like this AAI, and there's one called AAV. So we see a bit more diversity. And now we're gonna link it up to the phenotypes that we collected in the field. So people who um, were ranked as 14 had very good tasting ability. And those who are down here at zero couldn't taste at all. And people who had that PAV haplotype, which is dominant, were very good tasters. And people who had the AVI, who are homozygotes, had two co copies of that, were bad, not good tasters, like in Europe. But those who had these other haplotypes, like AAV and AAI, were intermediate in their perception. And this is mainly found in Africa. In fact, if we looked outside of Africa, that's what we would have found. So we're seeing more diversity in Africa. Now, we can also look at how these haplotypes are related to each other. This is called a network, and the lines between them are showing the mutations that connect these different networks. And what we can see is that the non-taster haplotype and the taster are very divergent from each other. And then we have these intermediate ones that also are associated with intermediate tasting, and they're mainly present in Africa. And this is the, um, what's present in the chimp. So chimps are actually able to taste. They have the ancestral PAV. Now, interestingly, when we look at this phenotype in diverse Africans, it's actually remarkably similar. So this did not, this is not what we were expecting. We thought they were gonna be very different, they're not. So in fact, what we're seeing is that variation of this gene is being maintained in all populations, probably due to natural selection. And then we could actually estimate the age of these mutations. Most of them, if we look at how old the variation is at this um, particular gene, it's over two million years. That's very, very old. Again, and that's consistent with these lineages, genetic variants being maintained for a long time. The age of the mutations, most of them predate the origin of modern humans. And then we have some rare variants that occurred more recently. So in conclusion, it looks like this is a target of natural selection, but we have no idea why. I don't know if it necessarily has to do with diet. One of the interesting things is, in the past few years, it's been shown that these receptors are not only on the taste buds, they're in the gut. And furthermore, about a year, maybe it was two years ago, there was a paper that came out that showed that they're expressed in the lungs, and that some of these chemicals that bind to them can open the airways better than any anti-asthma medication. So we're just beginning to understand what the physiological function of these receptors are, and my guess is that there's something else that's important that is maintaining these at very high frequency in the different populations. And so in conclusion, I've told you that Africans have the highest levels of genetic diversity um, in the world, both within and among populations. Their demographic history and adaptation to different environments has resulted in regional specific variation. And I want to push very strongly for the need to include ethnically diverse populations in these types of genomic studies that we're all here to talk about today. Because if we don't, we're gonna be missing not only rare, but even common variants like the lactose tolerance that could be not only specific to Africans, but specific to a particular region in Africa. And um, some of these will be associated with normal variation and some with disease risk. And I'll just end by thanking the many people who contributed, contributed to the study and special thanks to those Africans who contributed. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. So I was just wondering um, about, over here, okay. about uh, raw milk and, you know, some people who drink raw milk think that, you know, there are, there are bacteria in there that help people who are not tolerant of lactose mm -hmm. break it down and how that is uh, relevant to your work. Yeah, so that's, that's a really interesting point. Um, I think that there... I don't know so much about the bacteria being present in the milk, but you heard a talk earlier by Rob Knight, right? And he talked about 
that there can be um, bacteria in your gut, for example. And one of the things that we're actually doing is we're going back to some of these groups, like those pastoralists in East Africa, and we're going to look at the bacteria in their gut because I'm wondering if they might have bacteria that are actually playing a role in helping to digest the lactose. So that is possible. And then you can also process, right? We can make yogurt, we can make cheese. There's a way to process dairy products so that there are bacteria added that can break this down and make it more digestible. So there have been cultural adaptations to allow people to be able to consume dairy products. Uh, can I ask a question about the persistence of this uh, trait? Have you looked at overlapping diseases where diarrhea and di you know, uh, dehydration diseases can kill neonates and infants and mm -hmm. the coexistence of a disease like sickle cell anemia? Which, yeah. where is this overlapping that would cause perhaps yeah. some reason to persist? So I don't really see correlations with any of those per se because you could imagine that having severe diarrhea is a very negative selective force anywhere in Africa, right? That's gonna result in high- I'm actually saying it protects. Oh, having diarrhea? No, no, having this trait may protect oh, absolutely. you. absolutely. In fact, that's, that is one of the theories. One of the theories has to do with the fact that perhaps one of the, um, besides the nutrients that you're getting from the milk, it's actually a great source of water, okay? But you can't entirely say that this is there to protect from having diarrhea, because if that were the case, it would have evolved independently in, say, West Africans. The main thing it's correlated with is the ability to drink milk. And then what was the second part? You had a well, second? Well, other very common diseases. Common the overlap diseases, of like sickle right. cell anemia. Yeah, example. so again, although you may see a correlation, I think it's not a direct correlation. And it's because the West Africans, where you tend to see a lot of um, high prevalence of malaria, don't often, they don't have cattle domestication. In the few groups that do have cattle, like there's a group called the Fulani, we actually do see that they can drink milk. So I really think in this particular case, it's mainly correlated with some, you know, something having to do with nutrition from milk, possibly the benefits of having uh, water in an arid environment and so on. Is there other questions? No? Okay. Is that it? Mm. Thank you. Thanks.